My name is Shelby. Um, I'm the education coordinator here at New Hampshire Audubon McLean Center. Um, I know we met a while ago, so you might not remember who I am, um, but I just wanted to reintroduce myself. Um, I'm going to be kind of moderating the whole uh, webinar here today, and we have some really fun and exciting things to share with you. Um, the way this is going to work is we're going to um, kind of go over the project and everything you guys have been doing. Uh, we'll talk about what we're going to talk about today, and then we're going to see a really cool, awesome slideshow by Chris. And then at the end, you guys will have a chance to ask some questions. Um, so kind of an overview of the project of everything you guys have been doing so far. I know I'm kind of jumping in at the end here, uh, but I've heard lots about it, and it sounds like it's been really great. Um, you've been learning about uh, bird biology, specific to peregrine falcons. You have been um, watching their nesting and their breeding. Um, basically, and you've been doing that all through the uh, webcam that we have on the nest in, at the Brady Sullivan Building in Manchester. So you guys have been watching and making observations and uh, doing projects and all kinds of other things. Um, and all of this is possible through the DOOR Foundation, um, which is basically what funds the project. Um, and it's possible through you guys doing the project and your teachers participating and um, joining in. So we're really excited to be able to hopefully continue this project uh, next year and hopefully for years to come. So, okay, I have um, so let's see. So a couple things that we're going to do today, um, we're going to go and we're going to have a little slideshow with Chris. Um, there are lots of pictures talking about chick hatching, chick, chick development, um, what they'll be doing in the coming weeks, um, and all kinds of things like that. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about next, and then you'll have the time for questions at the end. So um, I will pass it off to Chris now. Thanks, Shelby. Um, in case you don't remember, my name is Chris Martin, not Captain Raptor. Uh, I'm the uh, bird biologist for uh, Birds of Prey at New Hampshire Audubon. I remember coming to uh, uh, the middle school in um, Feb February, wasn't it? And we had a, a, a great session there that Shelby was at, and I uh, appreciate uh, you being involved with that. Isn't it cool to watch these baby peregrines grow? I oh. just, I, it's so neat to be able to be inside that nest box in Manchester. Um, I've got a show to give you today about uh, what will happen as they continue to develop. And I also want to uh, show you uh, other peregrine falcon nests around the state that aren't in a similar situation to the nest box in Manchester. Um, to give you a better idea of the of range of types, types of places that peregrines nest. So I'm really glad everybody could show up for this this morning. Uh, I know your school year is almost over and that, that's got really exciting. But uh, um, hopefully you'll enjoy this today. And I also hope that uh, we're going to be able to uh, um, share uh, the banding of these baby peregrines next week with anybody on YouTube who wants to see it. Uh, we're working towards that right now and I should have more information for you. Uh, hopefully at the end of the program today, we can talk about that. Um, it's, uh, it's neat to be able to, uh, um, to see that. So hopefully you'll have an opportunity to next week um, in your busy schedules. So let's see if I can get to my slideshow here. Um, I'm not as good um, Zoom as, as some people are, I think, but I'm getting there. Yay. Everybody see this show? You bet. Again, um, this is a, a project funded by the Door Foundation and uh, we're really excited to be trying this out with uh, your fifth grade class. So thanks to uh, Mrs. Brotherson, Mrs. Gitmark, and Mrs. Tremblay for, for all your efforts on this. So uh, this is actually the kind of place that most peregrine falcons like to nest. Big rock cliffs, um, places like Franconia Notch. And if uh, 
where's my little cursor? My cursor's, there it is. Uh, everybody see my arrow moving around, right? So uh, if you look really closely right here, I'm gonna go zoom in on that spot. There's an adult peregrine uh, incubating her eggs on a nest. Um, kind of like a big vertical building, but um, these rock cliffs are the kind of places that these birds nest regularly. But in addition to all of our granite cliffs in the state, they also nest in places like this. This is the uh, Bow Power Plant, Merrimack Station uh, in Bow, New Hampshire, just north of Hooksett on the Merrimack River. And we put up a nest box on this miniature stack here, not the biggest stack, but on this one right here. And there's the nest box right on the catwalk. And if you look closely, you can see a couple peregrine chicks that are about the same age as the ones in Manchester are today. So that's a different sort of place. That's the place that biologists worked with um, the managers of this site to create a nest spot. Because without that box and the gravel in the box, where would the peregrine falcons put their eggs on that metal grate? It wouldn't work. Here's another place, not far south of where you guys are. Who's scribbling on the screen? <laughs> um, here's a, uh, a bridge, the 293 bridge on the south side of Manchester. We worked with the New Hampshire Department of Transportation to put up a nest tray on, on this spot um, underneath the bridge where it never rains. Here's the tray before it was installed, uh, put underneath the bridge and bolted into place. And here are two adult peregrines um, getting ready to uh, feed their young. So I just want to show you, uh, we were lucky enough several years ago to install a nesting, a nest camera on a cliff that would take pictures when there was motion. We installed it right in here where these peregrines nested on Bear Mountain in Hebron. Here's the camera being installed by a colleague of mine who is also wearing a camera on his head, as you can see there. This is high technology using duct tape to tape a game camera to a tree, huh? But that's what we did. And it was worth it because we got these great pictures, which I'm going to show you now. Uh, uh, as a side note, this mama peregrine uh, it was a bird that we caught and we actually installed a satellite transmitter on her. You can see the transmitter wire and the transmitter is right here with a little solar powered um, um, power plant on it. Um, this bird is still wearing this transmitter six years later. And she actually has moved to a different nest site uh, about 30 miles to the west of this location. But look at I'm going to I'm going to show you a series of pictures all of the same spot uh, from the same angle and you're going to see this egg and the other eggs develop and grow just like you've watched the Manchester peregrine chicks. So I'm going to cycle through this rather quickly. Let's go uh, and you also see this uh, camera. The cool thing about the camera is it was able to record weather conditions at the bottom of the screen and the date, the time. And uh, so we're going to advance through this. You're gonna see about six weeks of peregrine development here in the next 30 seconds. So there's, there's mama and the little babies, about a week old. And then they grow a little bit bigger. And uh, they get more, aggressive in their demands for food and they grow a little bit bigger like they're kind of getting look at this one now it's uh, almost as big as the parent bird and then the downy feathers start to get replaced by their real feathers you can see them sprouting out from inside the down and then now i want to get rid of that there we go um, then they really start to feather out. And then you can see the development, it can be a little different from one to the next. 
This is probably the first hatched bird. He's he or she is most developed, and the second hatched bird, and then the last hatched of these three is the least developed. Um, you can see that in the Manchester peregrines with the there's definitely two that hatched first, hatched on the second of May. Those guys are getting really big, and the the last two hatched are considerably smaller um, than those two. A little bit bigger, losing almost all of their down, and they get really mobile. They start to move around. Uh, what you're going to see in Manchester is you're going to see them jump out onto the front porch of that nest box. Uh, any any day now, we might see that. Probably about probably about a week from now to ten days from now, and then they'll start hopping around out there and hopping back in, just like these guys are scrambling all over the rocks. Then the down is almost gone, and they really develop personalities. They look just like uh, young adult peregrines, and then they start leaving the nest. And finally, the last one is there all by itself. Um, the others have moved on to nearby trees or nearby ledges on the cliff. And we're going to see that in Manchester where there's four, then there's three, then there's two, then there's just one. And then we might even see them start to come back to the box after that and they learn to fly. So that's the situation. Amazing that these little babies can grow up in a spot just like this where three feet away from where they are hanging out, the, the it's 150 feet to the ground and they are so capable of staying put in those precarious spots it's amazing uh, next week uh, probably on Tuesday morning uh, although it's not absolutely confirmed yet Tuesday morning the 26th we're going to live webcast uh, the banding of the four peregrine chicks um, from this year and uh, I can send your teachers a YouTube link that hopefully they can pass on to you. And uh, if you wanna watch next Tuesday morning, I expect it's gonna be around 10.30. Again, we have not got final confirmation on that, but Tuesday the 26th at 10.30 is what we're shooting for. And I'll share that those links as soon as I have them. That should be fun. When the Peregrine Chicks are uh, three weeks old, we do the banding. Um, but this picture here shows them when they're four weeks old. They get a really kind of uh, sort of ragged punk appearance here. Um, they, these guys have all been banded at this point. And uh, you can see the coat, the coat on the color band here and uh, their other band they put on, we put on their other leg. These guys are about four weeks old. Um, again, about a, a four week old baby peregrine. The down is starting to disappear. Once they fledge from the nest at six weeks, they end up in some really strange places. This guy is kind of in peregrine jail. Uh, you'll see in the background, this is the Brady Sullivan Tower where the nest is. This one managed to fly across the parking lot to an apartment complex, a condo complex, and end up on somebody's front porch. And they took a picture of it. Uh, sometimes their first flights are not particularly good they end up they're not they're not strong they end up on the ground in very embarrassing positions like this guy imagine being the king of the air being able to fly 200 miles an hour or at least have that potential but to be stuck on the ground while looking up at people that that's got to be embarrassing for that that young peregrine he was actually just really tired from, from his efforts uh, he picked himself up Still, he's on the ground. This is not a place a peregrine spends much time. Um, and these young birds are really trying to figure everything out. They get uh, attacked by the things that soon they will eat. <laughs> mockingbirds will, or will attack these baby birds because the mockingbird's nest is close by and uh, it's trying to chase this uh, threat away. One day soon, this peregrine could catch a mockingbird in the air and take it to feed its young. So the tables will turn. 
What happens after they fledge when they're six weeks of age? Fledging is when they leave the nest for the first time by flying. And uh, once they learn to fly, then the parents will bring food items like this uh, uh, bird that the adult caught and fly around and encourage the young birds, the one here on the bottom, to uh, learn to use their feet to take food from the parent and to learn how to manipulate those food items. So this adult is basically doing flight training with this baby, teaching it how to maneuver and, and handle prey. One day in maybe June or July this summer, our young peregrines will leave in the background here. You can see the Brady Sullivan building is right there. It's way up the street. These birds will fly all over the area uh, around Manchester all the way downtown to City Hall Plaza right here. Here's two different juvenile peregrines from a, a previous year on the City Hall Plaza top level. They'll hang out there with each other. Uh, they'll fly back and forth to the Brady Sullivan building again, uh, getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And at one point, they will begin to disperse from the area. They'll leave Manchester. And they're on their own then, no parent birds to help them out. Um, they could end up just about any place. And that's one of the reasons we put bands on them is to be able to figure out where they come from and where they go to. Uh, this young peregrine from Manchester ended up at Plum Island a few years ago. And a photographer there got uh, lovely pictures of him um, in his first winter in December. So as a six month old baby peregrine. Another place near Plum Island, uh, peregrines sometimes find um, other birds, other peregrines that uh, come from different nest sites and they socialize with each other. They get to know each other. They um, uh, basically just play and uh, learn how to be falcons. Uh, so the adventures ahead of these birds are um, many. Uh, most of them, I think, uh, will survive. We always will lose a few that uh, have an injury or an accident or uh, fall prey to some uh, trouble out there in the world. But uh, the ones that survive are uh, likely to end up breeding somewhere in New England. This is a great picture of a young peregrine um, in the if next spring uh, after uh, a year they look like this, or they actually begin to get their adult feathers like this one. Look at the difference between these two. These are all um, the first plumage, the first set of feathers that they get when they uh, develop in the nest. Um, this is their first uh, set of feathers. They're all brown, but when they replace those in a, something called a molt where they get new feathers, the new feathers that come in are gray, like these right here. So this bird is in transition, probably a year to a year and a half old, growing its new feathers to replace the old brown ones that are wearing out. And falcons will do this, uh, uh, birds of prey do this every year. They partially molt their feathers and replace about half of them with new ones. And you can see there's a pattern to this, this uh, third or fourth primary feather on this side is coming in at the same time as this new feather on this side. So it's symmetrical. They're actually, both halves of their body are doing the same thing. And eventually these brown feathers are all replaced. The brown feathers like this bird has, this is 17 BD as a immature bird with all brown feathers. A few years later, another photographer at the same spot maybe even the same telephone pole, got this picture of 17 BD, the same bird, but several years later, and look at the difference in its uh, coloration. Pretty neat. So in two or three years, these young peregrine chicks that you're seeing in Manchester now, hopefully will look very similar to this one in this picture, complete with their own ID tags. And I have my fingers crossed that we will locate them again and be able to figure out where they dispersed to, who they mated with, 
and how successful they are raising their own babies. So that's, uh, that's what I look forward to as a raptor biologist. And uh, I just wanna also say that the pattern of growth and change in baby, baby raptors, whether they be daytime raptors like hawks and falcons or nocturnal raptors like most of the owls, um, the pattern is similar. And I think uh, Shelby, who takes care of our birds of prey at New Hampshire Audubon, um, has seen that and has some pictures of her own, I think, that you want to share. Can I go ahead to your first slide, Shelby? Yeah, yeah let's do it. Go ahead. All right. So uh, this first photo we're looking at um, is just a kind of a good timeline or example of what a barn owl um, will look like as they start to age. Um, so fresh from the egg all the way up to um, pretty much fledgling, full on their own, um, and out flying. Um, the photos that you're going to see in the next couple of slides are of our barn owl, who you guys actually met back in February at your school. Um, so he came from a, uh, the Avian Conservation Center in South Carolina. Um, he was raised basically for education here in New Hampshire Audubon. Um, and it was really awesome because we got to see him, you know, kind of grow up. They sent us photos of him developing. Um, so this first photo here is of him at about 16, 15 to 16 days um, out of the egg. Their um, eyes basically stay shut until they're around 13 days. So this is probably a photo of him like sleeping or, um, you know, his eyes are just starting to open up. So at this point, he's just starting to develop, to develop those tiny feathers and his eyes are starting to open up, but pretty much he's still being hand fed um, by um, the people who raised him um, and is kind of, I guess you could say, kind of useless. <laughs> um, you can go to the next one. So this one is at about uh, 25 days. So he um, has started to develop those fluffy downy feathers. His eyes are wide open um, and he is still being hand fed, um, but can kind of, you know, move around on his own. Um, at around 35 days, they start, if they're in a nest, they're starting to move around. Um, at that point, uh, he was probably just starting to kind of explore and be able to move around on his own. Uh, this photo is the first day that he arrived at New Hampshire Audubon. So he was around 45 days at this point. You can see he has still a lot of downy feathers, but you can kind of see his uh, contour feathers and the feathers, his you know real feathers kind of coming in and uh, kind of developing underneath as you saw with the falcons. It's very similar where they still have those downy feathers and the other, the new feathers are kind of coming out on top. Um, so yeah, this was the first, first photo of him at New Hampshire Audubon. He couldn't really fly at this point. So they're kind of, he did a lot of walking around at our center. Um, he had a whole room to himself where he could explore. Um, and at this point they, he's starting to maybe hop a little bit to different surfaces and things, but he's not, not full, full on flying. And then the next photo is of him. Um, this was probably from a couple months ago, um, but this is pretty much him now. So he is, has lost all those downy feathers. He has all of his flight feathers, his contour feathers, um, all of the feathers that basically give him his coloration, allow him to fly, um, give him basically the way he looks. So um, barn owls typically take eight weeks to fledge um, from the nest if they are out in the wild. Um, in captivity, obviously, it's, you know, they're on their own. At this point in this photo, he was uh, fully flighted and could uh, fly and definitely has those barn owl instincts to him. So even though he was raised in captivity by humans, he still has, he definitely still has some barn owl um, instincts, I guess, if you will. So still knows how to be a barn owl. He just doesn't really know how to go and get his own food. So he gets food every day and we don't have to worry about him, you know, struggling to find his own food like the peregrines have to. So that is just kind of a comparison of two different uh, raptors and very, you can see some very similar um, similarities between the two, but I just wanted to show you kind of another bird of prey development. 
And I think Ooh. that is the last slide we have here. I think. Yeah, I'm trying to get my my final. There we go. There we go. So that's that's the end of our uh, formal slideshow. I suspect now the fun will start when we try to figure out how to do questions and answers. So. <laughs> yes. Um, so the way we kind of said this was going to work, um, we're going to have you guys. You guys will have a chance to actually ask your own questions. Um, Chris and I will uh, hopefully be able to answer all of them. Um, so if you have a question just use the raise your hand function or the thumbs up or the clap um, and you have the opportunity to ask your questions and I think um, it might be easiest if your teachers call on you that way because you guys know them um, if that works for you guys. Good does anybody have a question? We got a couple people with their hands raised already. Okay. We have Madeline, Cohen, Jonathan, Jonah. Okay. Let's start with the, Jonah, do you still have your hand up? Yep. He's on page two. There you go, bud. Okay. Um, so how come the mom has been like, gone a lot more than usual she, like when she when they used when they were little and they were hatching out she used to be there all the time and now whenever I observe she's never there uh Jonah that's a good question I'm glad that you noticed that change that's that's the sign of a good scientist who notices the differences that occur from one time to another think about uh those little tiny babies they needed to have protection and they needed to have someone else provide them with warmth. So the mother bird not only was guarding them, but was helping to keep their temperature up um, by covering them up or being close to them. Um, and then especially the idea of guarding against uh, them because they're so vulnerable when they're small. But now um, they actually can move around the box. They are very mobile. In fact, they pester the mother for, for, uh, for food all the time. What you have to realize is that camera shows about five square feet of a peregrine falcon's world. And all that mother peregrine has to do is fly to the next window shelf over, which is about 10 feet away. She can still guard against threats, but she doesn't have to necessarily be in the nest box. So that's, that's what you're seeing is the fact that the 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 need for her to be right there on top of them is no longer um, the case. Next Thank question, you. Madeline. Um, when I was watching the programs, the dad um hasn't been there. I don't know where he he like hasn't been in the nest at all. Um. Yeah, I remember when they were incubating eggs, he spent about, oh, I'd, I'd say 35 to 40% of the time, it was him that was on top of the eggs, keeping them warm, not just the female. Um, again, I go back to the fact that your camera only sees a little part of the world. Um, what it doesn't see is that male does the majority of the hunting, while the female, because she's bigger, stands guard at the nest to keep uh, potential predators away. So he's, he's out there flying around catching starlings or robins or, or other food items. And he comes flying back to the nest. And in fact, when she's sitting outside of the nest, she's actually able to see him coming with food, fly out and take it from him and bring it back to feed the babies. Uh, okay. But you, yeah, you'll also see Sooner or later, if you're, if you're lucky, you'll see, I saw this this weekend, I saw both peregrine adults in the nest box at the same time. One was feeding three of the chicks and one was feeding the little one uh, at the same time. They were both in the box, each with some food, uh, feeding at the same time. That was really cool. 
Okay, so that's why the, I never see him? Yeah, he, he it, it, if you change your camera to the perch instead of the, the view of the, the nest tray itself, you might see him sitting out on the outer shelf or you might see him on the perch pole. But again, there are dozens and dozens of places on the building where he can sit close by, but, but not in the box. And he's out hunting most of the time. So that's, that's, that's why he's not there as much. Okay. Try Jonathan. So, um, first thing, hello. And um, I have a question. Um, so um, and the, sometimes when I'm watching the Peregrine Falcons live, the camera um, sometimes um, glitches. Sometimes it's not like live for me. So what is happening? I'm I'm not really sure uh, that I understand what you're what you're seeing at those times. You're saying does the camera freeze? Yes. Yeah. Well, that is technology at its finest. Okay. Uh, we're lucky that my picture is not freezing right now because uh, sometimes the the uh, the signal doesn't come through without interference. Um, so that may be what's going on there. Um, I encourage you to to switch from one camera view to another. See if it's any better. Um, it'll be a different view, obviously, but uh, we have to put up with things like that now and then. Um, even though it's not what we'd like. Um, sometimes everything doesn't work out quite the way we want it. But we're doing the best we can. And I just am so delighted that we can see these birds both day and night. If this was on a cliff, there's no way we could hang out with them like this. So it's really fun. Yes. Thanks, Jonathan. You're welcome. Okay, let's try Isabel. Um. One of the days I was on the camera, I saw the female peregrine like taking feathers out of her wing or like she was plucking something. She would put her beak in her wing. I don't know why she was doing it. Uh, birds of prey. I don't know, Shelby, you want to talk about uh, preening at all? You, I'm happy to, but if you want to. I'm muted. <laughs> oh, there we go. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, we can, we can both talk about it. Preening basically is what birds do to basically clean themselves or um, so what you're seeing Isabel is the bird using uh, her beak to kind of pull the feather, not pull it out. She's not like plucking the feathers out. What she's doing is she's kind of using her beak to kind of pull the oils or anything that is on her uh, feathers trying to basically cleaning it off. That's the way she's kind of combing, isn't she? Yeah, yeah. She's kind of fixing her feathers and cleaning and combing her feathers. Yeah. Uh, there are parasites that uh, uh, like to get inside uh, birds' feathers, get close to their body, um, and uh, that's one of the things that the birds are doing is cleaning the, uh, the parasites off, cleaning uh, pieces of food off that get scattered on them, cleaning uh, the poop from their babies off that ends up on them by accident. Um, feathers need to be maintained, otherwise they... Uh, they don't, they're not as buoyant in the air and uh, they don't uh, function as effectively um, for birds to fly. So the other thing is the feathers um, are their raincoats and they have a gland down by their tail that has oil in it and they use that gland to uh, uh, keep the feathers uh, in top shape. Uh, by spreading the oil all over their feathers. It's their waterproofing. And you'll see them bend their um, neck back so their beak goes clear back by their tail. They're actually um, going to that oil gland to get oil to preen their feathers with. Hmm. Huh. Okie doke, Cohen. So um, my first question is, how old are the parents? Mm -hmm. That's a good question, Cohen. Uh, one of the reasons that we put ID bands on these birds when they're babies is to be able to tell how old they are in future years. Um, 
both of our adult peregrines at the Brady Sullivan building are unbanded birds. Um, so we don't have absolute knowledge of their age, but based on a couple assumptions, I, I think we do know how old they are. Uh, one of those birds showed up uh, as an immature bird about six years ago. Uh, both of them are about six to seven years old now. Uh, we saw when the last two birds, uh, male and female, were replaced by these two. And we haven't seen anything to indicate that these two birds have switched in the last couple of years. So we believe they're six and seven years old now. Um, one thing that uh, raptor biologists think about is how to put ID tags on adult peregrine falcons. And the big question there is, how do you catch them safely? And we haven't had an opportunity to catch these adults and put tags on them, um, which would help us see how long they survive. You can imagine an unbanded peregrine falcon, uh, if one of these two birds were to die and be replaced by another, the question is, would we know that it had been replaced by another unbanded bird? Obviously, if it showed up with a leg band on, we'd know something had happened and that it was a different bird. But um, raptor biologists like me think about, well, what happens if when we reach in to get the baby peregrines out to put bands on them, what if the mama peregrine jumped on my glove and grabbed my hand to try to get me out of there? What if I took my other hand and I, I put it on her back and caught her? Um, We've thought about that. It hasn't worked out yet, but I'm always thinking that whenever we enter the nest box to ban the baby birds is, can we catch an adult? And uh, maybe this will be the year. Wouldn't that be great to see that um, happen? We'll see. Mm -hmm. Long answer to a short question. <laughs> and my second question is, was there anything wrong with the fifth egg because it never hatched? Like, was it not before, was it, not fertilized or did the embryo just not um, develop well, properly? Cohen, we, we really don't know the answer to that question right now. It's possible to uh, collect that egg and we probably will collect that egg when we ban the babies next week, if it's still there and still intact. Um, oftentimes, not all five peregrine eggs, if there are five, hatch. Um, sometimes it's a result of it not getting enough warmth at the end when the others have all hatched and the uh, adults aren't really incubating as well. It could also be that that egg was never fertile um, and it didn't have a chance of ever developing. Um, and to be honest with you, although I think we know which eggs hatched compared to which eggs were laid first and second, I'm not positive that that was the last egg laid that didn't hatch. It's even possible that it was the first egg laid and it never hatched. Um, we can do some math and figure that out as close as we can, but there's a lot of uh, variation in, in nature and we're never exactly, sh it's not like, it's not like it, each egg takes exactly the same amount of time to hatch. It's close. We expect about 35 to 36 days for each egg. Uh, needs to be incubated before it'll hatch. Did I just leave the meeting? No, I think my 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 it. screen just changed. <laughs> there we go. That's the that's the moderator doing that apparently. Um, anyway, so uh, we're not sure the situation. It's common for not all of the eggs to hatch though. Okay. This is fun. <laughs> Let us try Jacoby. Um, my question is, I saw the mom feeding one bird more than the other. A little bit. Yeah. Um, usually the one that gets the most food is the biggest because its mouth is closest to the adult. It can, it can move around and get where the food is quickest. And one of the ways that raptor adults deal with that, they like to give food to all their babies, but 
it's hard to get food to the tiniest when the big one is right there in the way to grab each bite. So mm -hmm. what they sometimes do is stuff the big ones full of food first, and then they go into a food coma and sleep it off. And then the other babies can get food. And another thing about that strategy is if there's ever a food shortage, it guarantees that at least one or two big healthy babies will survive uh, to, uh, to, to, to uh, fledge from the nest if there's ever a shortage of food. Now, if there's plenty of food, they all get their share. And uh, it doesn't mean that each chick gets a bite after on its, you know, one bite for number one, bite for number two, bite for number three, bite for number four. Sometimes it's one, 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 two, one, 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 four, one, 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 three. And eventually you fill up number one and the other birds get their chance to have, have their food too. Thanks. Let's see who else has their hand up. Mm, I think I missed somebody. Brendan. Okay, so my question is: is like, how do the uh, peregrines keep war or keep cool in the summertime when it's super hot out? Um, we talking about um, when they're big and can fly away, or right now while they're still in the nest box? No, when they're big and they can fly away. Okay. Well, um, several ways. And I'm, uh, Shelby may have something she wants to add to this too, since she knows about a lot of raptors that have to keep cool at Audubon, right? Mm -hmm. um, they can fly to shady spots is one thing they can do. Um, if you think about it, um, there's uh, lots of shady places in trees and on the back side of buildings out of the sun where they can go, they can uh, go and take a bath uh, in the Merrimack River, for example, and get their feathers wet. And uh, that's one way they can cool off. They um, don't sweat. Peregrine falcons and other birds of prey don't sweat. They pant. So you'll see them more and more as uh, we get into these warm weather this week, it's supposed to be 80 on Friday, uh, you'll see the adults with their mouths wide open, panting, just like almost like a dog pants when you, when you take your dog for a walk. That is a way that they cool off. Um, uh, getting overheated is a problem for, for uh, birds of prey and they have to take steps to avoid that. Shelby, do you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, I was just gonna say that here um, at our center with our captive raptors, um, they all have their own individual water dishes. So a lot of the times if they get hot, they'll go down and kind of splash around in there. Um, our uh, parent raised birds, so the birds were raised in the wild and then brought to our facility to live out their life because they were injured um, in some way. They, we don't often see them down in their water dishes just because maybe they're a little bit weary. Um, our bald eagle who has been with us for around 25-ish years, he loves his water. He will get down in it. He'll like dunk his head underneath and splash around. So our birds in captivity, I mean, one of the main things they do is to get down in their water and splash around. Um, and then they all have shady spots in their enclosures. Um, something we can do if like we're out at a program or something and it's really warm, we can kind of spritz them with water. Um, but basically, yeah, they pant and they, they, they don't sweat like we do, um, but they, they have their ways of keeping cool. Good question. Yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay. Nice. Eli. Brody. Yes. Eli, do you have a question? Yeah, I, I, I want to show you a picture. Oh. <laughs> hmm. That one's an owl. It's the owl that came out during the day. At your house? Yeah. Ooh. I can't. My husband saw an owl yesterday too during the day. What I have a question for Eli. Was it covered with uh, regular feathers or was it fluffy and puffy? It was big. And it was staring <laughs> at us through the window. 
<laughs> well, um, one possibility at this time of year, there's a lot of owl babies who are fledging from their nests right now. And uh, they end up in some really funny spots, like the peregrine chicks I showed you in the video. Uh, I had somebody send me a picture of, an, of a baby great horned owl in their lilac bush right outside their kitchen window. And it was looking right in the kitchen window at them. And it still had downy feathers on it. So if this bird is sitting still there all day long, it's probably a baby. And well, it's about, yeah. it's about mm, a foot and a half. Sounds like maybe uh, a barred owl or a, a great horned owl baby, but I-, I That's what we that. thought, a barred owl, but we were just wondering um, did look, why- Did it look like this? Minus the headphones. That's a <laughs> yes. barred owl, okay. Yes, it well, was maybe. pretty cool. But he's been hanging around, or she's been hanging around, and so we think maybe there's eggs and or babies in the tree. We have a lot of trees behind our apartment. We just did some research on native owls of New Hampshire, um, and he's very he talks a lot. Cool. My my guess, and you know, I don't have a picture of your owl in front of me that I can see. My guess would be it is a fledged young owl and the okay. talking is called a contact note, which it gives to let the parents who are still feeding it know where it is. That would be my guess. Um, I could be wrong about your situation, but there are probably several others like it who are out in the woods around your, your house doing the same thing, but this one is happens to be where you can see it. Thank you. Okay, Brody, let's hear your question. Um, in like the bird box or like any, like in the bird box with the pregnant falcons, how do the baby birds get water? Is that for me, Shelby? Yeah, you can go. <laughs> okay. Um, well, they don't do a lot of drinking. Uh, they get water in the food that comes into them. Uh, there's a lot of moisture in the meat that they're eating um, and that is where they get their water from and in fact the the unusual uh sort of poop that uh that raptors do with all that white that comes out it's called uric acid and it's a different sort of uh, uh waste product than than humans and other mammals produce and uh it's designed to have uh to be conservative of water so they're not losing a lot of water like we do when we go to the bathroom, but uh, um, they conserve water. So they are able to get enough moisture from their food until they're able to fly away. And actually they'll do some drinking, but it's not a major way of, 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 of hydrate. Is that correct, Dr. Raptor, Raptor Carer? Yes. Okay. This is, uh, this is great. You guys have wonderful questions. No. Usman. Um, my question is, how long is a um, newborn peregrine falcon's beak? Um, I'd like you to repeat that question. I heard newborn peregrine falcon beak, but I didn't get the rest of it. How long is the newborn peregrine falcon's beak? How long, how long is it? Oh gosh! How strong? How strong? Um, they well, when they're first hatched, they're not strong at all. They can't do anything. Um, they certainly couldn't rip food themselves, and that's why you saw the uh, adults tearing off little tiny bite-sized pieces and putting them all the way. Yeah. Uh oh. <laughs> This is bound to happen at least once, right? <laughs> can you continue, Shelby? Yes, I can continue, I think. <laughs> so um, I believe what Chris was continuing to say there was so that the, the parents will actually 
you know, rip apart the food for the chicks and actually like put it directly down into their beak, down into their, you know, esophagus where they're actually going to swallow it. So they don't really have the capabilities to, you know, rip things apart themselves. And that's why in some of those photos you were seeing the parents actually feeding the chicks themselves and directly into their mouths. So we lost us there, but I believe that that is the, the answer there. Okay. okay. Let's see. I saw Mason with his thumb I up. I know. Mason, you had such great questions on your, on your uh, doc. Do you have any questions, Mason? Yeah, my question is, so every single time the female sees the male, um, they start making a lot of noise, or when the male sees a predator, they start making a lot of noise? Um, so uh, one of the reasons that they're probably making a lot of noise is to maybe warn off a predator. Um, so they try to make themselves as loud as possible, maybe as big as possible um to try to kind of warn off those the predators and things as far as when the female and male see each other um i'm not 100 percent sure of why they may be making a lot of noise maybe they're excited to see each other or you know they're um you know just coming back to the nest and talking with each other um too bad chris isn't here to help with that question <laughs> he, if when he comes back we'll ask him again i'll make a note to ask him Okay, let's try Madeline. He's coming back in. Okay. Oh. Let me get oh, him back, back in here. How many eggs can the Falcons lay? Um, let's see. Hopefully Chris can answer this for you. He might be muted. He is. There he is. I'll unmute him. Oh. Hi, I'm back. <laughs> okay. I, I just went away. My computer, I mean, this is worse than freezing screen. This is, anyway, I heard your question about how many eggs. Yeah. Uh, peregrine falcons usually lay uh, from three to five eggs. Um, sometimes I've heard of them laying as many as six eggs in one group. Um, six is like the world record for most babies they've ever produced in one uh, clutch of eggs. But we've seen five chicks fledge in Manchester before, and we've often had four chicks fledge. Um, and I'll tell you, I think I told you this in February when we got together, there was one time where um, uh, the female laid, the female laid four eggs and, her, and she lost her mate and she abandoned those eggs mm -hmm. and she, um, mated with this new male and I think she laid five eggs then so she laid a total of nine eggs in a month wow. uh, not all in one group but uh, that's 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 the most I've ever heard of um, we had a question from Mason while you were gone about um, he asked sometimes when the male and the female come back to the nest or there's a predator or something they do a lot of like not talking but kind of making lots of noises could you explain why they might be doing that? Oh gosh, and you didn't explain that? Well, I mean, I said that they're trying to warn off predators. I don't know why the female and the male might be talking to each I, other. I, you know, I don't, I don't speak Falconese. <laughs> I don't either, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> but um, you can imagine the things that they might be talking about. There, right. there, there's a lot of different vocalizations that they do. And that's what's cool about having those microphones is there in there is we can actually hear what they're what they're up to, at least on that one camera, it has microphones. Um, they're, they're, I, you know, I wish I spoke Falconese. I, there are certain calls for when they see predators and there's danger to alert each other to that fact. There's a call that the male makes when he's on his way back with food. Um, sometimes half a mile away, he's vocalizing, and the female in the nest hears that and she flies out to meet him to grab the food. Um, it's not a coincidence that he's calling at that time. I think he's saying to her, I got some, come out and get it. And, uh, and, and that works. And then there's another call that the female does with the tiny chicks to get them, to encourage them to reach up with their 
mouth open to get food. It's a very fine, thin, gentle chirp uh, that you don't hear any other time. So she's talking to the babies then saying, okay, open up, there's food. Pretty cool. Can I ask one question? <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> um, as I've been observing, I've noticed that sometimes there's one of the babies that goes to the corner while the other three huddle together. And I was wondering, I can't tell if it's always the same one or if there's something going on there. Um, so that was my question. What, why is that one going away from the others? What I've noticed is as these babies get bigger, they develop this sense of personal space and they actually separate from each other sometimes to get peace and quiet. You'll see them go into the darkest corner, which I think is the coolest spot in the nest box uh, as a way of keeping cool. Um, uh, obviously, if they're laying on top of each other, they're probably warmer that way than if they were separated. So spreading out, stretching, they'll stretch their legs way out behind them and that exposed skin also helps cool them off. So I think cooling is part of it. Personal space is part of it. They begin to compete for the best places in the box. And uh, um, all those things are, are going on. You can really see them develop personalities by the time they get to the age that they're at now. So kind of like regular siblings. <laughs> they might even have their own favorite places on in that nest box, yeah. Okay. Um, shall we start wrapping things up? Yeah. Okay, I think that kind of comes to the end and hopefully we've answered most of your questions. If not, I mean, you can always reach out to us and ask any questions or any of your teachers any questions. Um, Shelby? But, yep, go ahead. Let, let me just say again, that as soon as I get the links to next week's uh, banding video, I will share that with uh, uh, Mrs. Brotherson, Mrs. Githmark, and Mrs. Tremblay and I will trust that they will be able to pass that on to their students. We will. Right. That'll be great. And it'll be great to have you see that. Yeah, it'll kind of be a nice wrap up of everything. And um, I just want to say thank you. I know I'm coming in a little late, but just from watching from afar of the, the work you guys have been doing, it's been fantastic. Um, all your hard work is paying off and you're almost to the end of your uh, year and you guys have been doing some awesome things. So. Um, Super yeah. impressive questions too, by the way. I know, yeah, they have been awesome. So. This is a, cl a class of 39 or 40 uh, junior raptor biologists. Oh, yeah, Good junior job. scientists. Exactly. Good job. Um, we, go ahead. Just, I just wanted to say to thank you as well. This has been a really unique opportunity to have um, you folks be able to come into our classroom and share your knowledge with the students. And that has been a, a incredible experience for me and for them. Um, and it's, it's been a, a very nice partnership. So we appreciate everything that you have done as well. Mm -hmm. Our pleasure. It was nice to see the change in the students and, uh, and how they displayed it through their work from the time that we started until the time that we ended. There was a tremendous amount of growth and they're even displaying that in their own lives, noticing birds in their backyards and sending us lots of pictures. So you've created this spark in many of our students that will hopefully be with them forever. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Good. Um, so yeah, I guess the final, the final thing is just your final projects, which we got a, a little glimpse of a couple days ago and they look amazing. Um, those hopefully are going to be featured on the big screen at the Brady Sullivan building where the peregrines actually are. So um, if you have a chance, maybe, you know, check them out or um, I just think it's awesome that those are going to be uh, featured there. So again, just thank you so much for everything that you guys have done. And um, yeah, you'll get to hopefully when Chris gets that the live stream, we'll get to check that out. So yeah. Chris, anything to add? Um, 
No, I think I'm good. It's just been uh, uh, great to get uh, so many people involved in watching uh, the, the Raptors in Manchester and uh, realize that birds of prey are every place. They're in your backyard. They're in the parks you go to. They're uh, in cities as well as uh, on the seacoast and in the mountains. And uh, there's lots of opportunity to learn more about birds of prey. And I hope that that opportunity is something you'll take advantage of.